So I would say the majority of women, wives, are blaspheming the word of God. I would say the majority of husbands that require their wives to, be, to disobey uh, the precepts and the dictates here in, in, in Titus chapter 2 are blaspheming the word of God. Open our Bibles to Proverbs 31. Yeah, we're returning to the godly mother, or a godly mother is a virtuous mother. The final of a seven-part study, character uh, character study, if you will, on the godly mother. <coughs> godly woman, godly men too. Proverbs 31. This is part two. Uh, we'll close with it, Lord willing. All right. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. What, my son, and what the son of my womb, and what the son of my vows? Give not thy strength unto women nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law, and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto, that, unto him, rather, that is ready to perish, and unwind unto those that be of heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty, and let him... And remember his misery no more, brother. Open thy mouth for the dumb and the cause of all such as are appointed to the destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. Amen. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth, she riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hands she planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, to the poor yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Heavenly Father, give thee thanks once again for the blessing of thy word. We give thee thanks, Lord, for the blessing of this virtuous woman, Lord, as described here in Proverbs 31. I pray, Lord, give me the wisdom and the unction to preach today and preach this message. In Jesus' precious and holy and wonderful name I pray, amen. Amen. So last week we went through, uh, we examined this or began our examination of the virtuous woman. This is the last characteristic, the seventh characteristic in our in our series and it was characterized by um uh, the mother really of of lemuel 
Some believe that Lemuel is another name for Solomon. Maybe so. The scripture does not make that clear. It is possible. I have to think that he was not a Gentile king. Nevertheless, he's not in question here. It is his mother that we're looking at. Look at that. And we viewed um, last week, we, or two weeks ago, it wasn't last week, so we had a guest preacher last week. But a couple of weeks ago, we, um, we kind of touched on the effects of, uh, uh, if you will, the, the influence and the effects of, of feminism on, on, on our culture, but also in our churches. We, and particularly, I would say, in, in the West, and one missionary preacher has put it, who's, who, who's planted churches in, in China and in the Philippines has, uh, has observed this, that within the churches in the West, in America, and in Canada as well, you have an underlying spirit within women uh, that they're not as read, read, they're not uh, willing, if you will, or readily or willing, if you will, to submit to the God-ordained authorities in their life. And it can be very, very subtle. But nevertheless, it is a trend that we see here. And I have seen it myself. And this is why I, I have mentioned that even that spirit of feminism that we've seen over the last 170 years has suddenly crept even to this church. There is a little bit of leaven there. And I'm not even just addressing women here. It can even be the mindset of a man, if you will. And uh, last week, we also uh, I quoted an article from Lori, Exa Lori Alexander. And again, uh, when you read her, you must use discernment. There are things that she says and teaches that I, I don't agree with. Um, now, obviously, her ministry is to teach women, but men read it. Uh, and, you know, when you really look at the ministry of an aged woman or an older woman teaching the younger women in Titus chapter 2 verses 3 to 5 really the context is in the local church um, I mean obviously she says some good things and I agree with much of what she says I don't agree with everything and therefore you need to exercise discernment when you're when you're reading her and of course she was dealing here if I go back a little bit um, to the article that I quoted here. It was entitled, Has God Called Women to Be Independent? And this is what's infected the West, particularly. Ladies, God has actually called you to be dependent on a man and to be a help me to him. There's nothing wrong with the, being dependent on your husband. In fact, the onus is on him to provide. And I'm not talking about just for your physical needs, but your spiritual needs as well. And of course, that's, that's, that falls under the auspices of headship, if you will, in the home. And so man actually has a taller order. The husband has a taller order in the home. But God has never called a woman to be independent. Really, he's not. Now I understand there are widows, but even then a widow is dependent to a degree. Right? We have widows here. And if you have living family members, children... And that really, and even grandchildren, that will make, you can extend that to grandchildren, really, they ought to be taking 1 Timothy chapter 5 a little more seriously than, than they do. You know, um, I look at my mom, I'm, I'm constantly thinking about her needs. That's why I pay mom's phone bill. And if mom needs help and we able, we're able to provide it, you know, it's, it's, it's something you ought to think about. Because a true widow indeed doesn't have family. This is when the church really steps up. Now, of course, the church will step up regardless. But you understand where I'm coming from here. Many women have been conditioned to feel that they need to make their own money, have their own bank account. Now, I'm talking in the context of marriage here. Have their own bank account uh, and be completely separate from their husbands. Uh, so they can go to the mall whenever they want. They can buy whatever they want, so on and so forth. You understand where we're getting at here. But God hasn't called them to be independent. Now, for saying this, I will be accused of being a misogynist, of hating women, but I don't. God has actually called you to be the helpmeet of your husband, your husband. And I'm looking at another one over here. And by God's grace, you're doing a wonderful, you know, you're fulfilling that. 
And 1 Corinthians 11, 9 says that the man was created for the woman. Neither was, sorry, the man was created, neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. God created the man first. Well, you're just a misogynist. No, take it up with God. You're calling him a misogynist. I'm just following what the Bible says. Now, of course, we're not, unlike Islam, we're actually called to love our wives self-sacrificially. And uh, we're, we're called to actually take care of her and honor her. We're, we're called to honor our wives as the weaker vessel. And, and, and really we bestow that honor upon her. And there's just so much involved in that. Now I want to quote here an excerpt from Dr. Lamour study on feminism because the virtuous woman is not a feminist and this the spirit of feminism has really permeated the warp and woof of our of our thinking just right across our western society as a whole even in the east like even the philippines it's still there it's there um they're just catching up and this is the Bible's, this is just an excerpt. The, he entitled this last part, The Bible's Elevation of Women in Light of Feminism. Because women aren't elevated in feminism. You're elevated by the world. You know, at Costco Wholesale, we had for a period of time something called Journeys, um, where it basically they would be holding seminars. And it was only now they've included men because now you've got these effeminated men. And everything else but they had these seminars um encouraging women to to move up in the company and and now you know through uh, i guess affirmative action if you will or whatever i don't know what you call it now but one of the 17 goals of the of, of agenda 2030 is this equity right were, you know equity diversity equity and in inclusivity so you have you have you have women now wanting to move up uh, my warehouse manager, 32 years of age. I don't know if she's planning to have children, but it's all about being the thing. I'm the boss. Walking in there, I'm the boss. I'm a woman. Ain't no man going to rule over me. Yeah, and it's against the creator. You see that now? And they're actually hiring, sadly. And... You know, I, I, I firmly believe you, you hire those who are qualified. I don't really care where you're from. I don't care uh, about the melanin content in your skin. I really don't. If you're qualified, then you are deserving of, of that job or the task at hand, right? Uh, but now <clears throat> they're, they're deliberately hiring black women, right? And then don't make it so obvious. Obviously, they're hiring others, but they need to have a quota there. Black women, or now even Muslim women, or so on and so forth. You understand where I'm going at here, or getting at. Well, but you're such a bigot. No, I'm not. <clears throat> I believe in merit. You know, I believe if you've earned it, uh, you're qualified, then you're the one who ought to get the job. I don't really care where you're from. <clears throat> So what he says, so this is your former pastor here, Dr. Lamour, he says, the Bible has been one of them, one of, sorry, one, has been the one means of the elevation of women. Amen. <clears throat> when the Bible is not regarded, women are degraded. They're degraded today. A woman with pink hair, about 75 pounds overweight, with multiple piercings, tattoos, tongue rings, uh, and, and, and literally flaunting yourself in the most lewd ways that you could possibly flaunt yourself because when she's confronted with the preaching, she, she feels the need to really express her lewdness and her licentiousness. Uh, that does not ele elevate women. It degrades that woman. Or in, uh, in, uh, in um, another example of this would be uh, when we preached outside the Hooters there, and you've got these young women with these short, 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 short shirts that are shorter than this belt that I'm wearing right now. And, and, and they're only, the only reason why they have them dressed like that, and the only reason why these young women will wear that, is because they know 
that they can, they can, they can flirt with this simp, this simpleton, if you will, of a man, uh, in order to garner more tips and therefore make more money. And when they're confronted about that, they say, "Well, I have my integrity intact, and I have all this intact, my dignity intact." No, you don't. You are selling your body to earn money, and you're using dumb, stupid men to do so. That they're true. So, so that does not elevate women. It's actually degrading her. And when you point out again, look, ma'am, you are fearfully, wonderfully made by God, and God wants you to cover up, and men cover up too, as well. The reason why I point out women more often than men is because men are visual. We're attracted to what we see through the eye gate. And as, as Dr. Fielder once said, that a, that a woman's body looks a whole lot better to a man than a man's body to a woman. Obviously, that's a very broad, <laughs> but you understand where I'm coming from. Plato's Republic represents women as grossly inferior to men. The Roman had the legal right to kill his wife. Confucius said women are different. Sorry, women are as different from men as earth is from heaven. Women indeed are human beings, but they are of a lower estate than men and can never attain to full equality with them. The aim of a female education, therefore, is perfect submission, not cultivation and development of mind. Actually, what I actually kind of agree to a degree what he said here. They understood it. They understood it. By the way, w women are of a lower state of men. This is why you don't see one woman in the NFL. When these Baptist preachers are cheering on the Cowboys today or the Cincinnati Bengals today, they're not cheering on their favorite female football player. <laughs> you can see the look on Luke's face there as I'm bringing that on. Go, Cowboys, go. No, no. <laughs> I don't, I don't. <laughs> way to bring us forth. Exactly. <laughs> I'm going to have my picture taken with four of the Cincinnati Bengals players. <clears throat> That's who I worship on Sunday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the sports references. <clears throat> In the sacred books, this is what Dr. Lamar said, in the sacred books of the Hindus, it is said, quote, the graces of womanhood are four, ignorance, fear, pureness, and modesty. Even they understood it. The four chapters of the Quran along with chapter Surah 38, 44, allows wife beating. Of course, I've often, on the streets there, I've quoted chapter 4 and verse 34, says here, men are maintainers of women because Allah has made some of them to excel others and because they spend out of their property. The good women are therefore obedient, guarding the unseen as Allah has guarded. And as to those on whose part you fear desertion, admonish them and leave them alone in the sleeping places and beat them. And beat them. Then if they obey you, do not seek a way against them. Surely Allah is high, great. Now, of course, we know the contemporary translations, in particular in English, will water down beat. But it's the same word used in chapter 8, verse 12, and it clearly means to strike. Strike. So if in Islam, it is perfectly accepted, if my wife is not obeying me, well, I can just go take her in the back room and just, not even my applied the rod of correction. I can just beat her until she has a black eye and all that. And Allah will be pleased. Just think about that for a moment. Well, you're spewing hate. You know, you're an Islamophobe. I'm just calling out what their book says. <clears throat> Chapter 38, 44 of the Quran says this, And take in your hand a green branch and beat her with it. And do not break your oath. Allah telling Job to beat his wife. <clears throat> Infidelity has always dishonored women, although Mrs. Elizabeth Cady Stanton claims that the Bible is responsible for whatever degrade, degradation rather women have suffered in this land, speaking of America, and the Bible is the great barrier to women's progress. No. 
The Bible's responsible for elevating women, glorifying, honoring women. If a woman seeks to obey the Bible and what it says about her and how she should conduct herself and live her life, that is the greatest honor bestowed upon her. Feminism says, you know what, the louder and more obnoxious you are and the more confrontational you are, and particularly with men, you are see these short reels sometimes. Where I, I don't always go on TikTok, but you see it on Facebook too and on, on Instagram. These short reels, and then you had this guy interviewing these English from the UK, these young, young ladies, and I hesitate to use the term yet, ladies. Do we need men? Oh, no. Do you think we need men? No. Oh, no. 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 You know what? If you took away men from our society, you know, we're not going to be meeting here. Someone built this place. I know it's shoddy construction, but they built this room. Someone built uh, the bus that you took. It was a man. Someone built those subway lines. Someone built that office building that you're working in. Someone built, it took a man rather, I'm going to say someone, that man took a man or men to build the Costco that I work in. I've seen them being built. 99.9% .9 of the workers are men. On the highway, do you see women at night? It took a man to build those roads that you drive your vehicle in to get to church. Yes, ladies, you need men. And we need you. So yes, we need men. Voltaire voiced the sentiment of infidelity toward women when he said, quote, ideas are like beards. Men have none until they grow up, and women none at all. Well, some do today, and they want that beard. <laughs> Even in Europe, where they have a form of Christianity, but where they have not had an open Bible... Women are degraded as we do not find them in this country. I, f I myself, on the continent of Europe, in many instances, women and dogs harnessed together drawing wagons. I saw, women, sorry, on the, saw on the continent of Europe, in many instances, women and dogs harnessed together drawing wagons. In one case in Leipzig, now this is not Dr. Lamore reading from his experience, he's reading, he's quoting here, just to, so you're probably looking, you know, I saw a woman and a dog drawing a wagon in which sat on an able-bodied man. I came near, quote, falling from grace on that man than I had come for a long time before or that I ever expect to come again. A woman and a dog drawing a wagon in which sat on an able-bodied man. <laughs> Crazy. You'll see that in Europe. It, that's what happens. When, you know, that's what happens when you throw out the book. Especially in Germany, a place like that. Ooh. Every, every modernistic <laughs> philosophy has come out of Germany. Spiritualism. Spiritualism was started by by women, Mrs. by the woman, by sorry, by women, the Mrs. Fox. Theosophy. So, spiritual was sta started by women, the Mrs. Fox. Theosophy was started by a woman, Madame Blavatsky. He's got some typos here. I should have went over it myself. But the so-called Christian science was founded by who? Yeah, Mary Becchiardi. That's correct. Absolutely. Modern perfectionism began with a woman. The Four Square Gospel Church in Los Angeles was founded by who? Amy Semple McPherson, a woman. All these movements have favored women's public speaking. The only safety for women and their one true progress lies in strict conformity to Bible teaching. This is not degrading women. It is honoring them. Their work in the world is no less important than men's. We've got ladies here. Your work in this world is no less important than men's, especially when it's in God's order. Some of you have raised children. My wife is still in the process of raising them. And, you know, she homeschools, keeps the home. She's busy. I've always said she works infinitely. Well, 
not infinitely, but you understand where I'm coming from, harder than many, than all the women I work with. I, I will even contend there's not one woman who I work with that can do what she does. Of course, it's by God's grace. God's grace. So women's work in the world is no less important than men's. And for us to assume that what he has told us in his word is not suited to these advanced times, you'll hear that often. Get with the times. We've moved on. No, we haven't. We need to get back to the Bible. This is an act of blight. This is literally, to get with the times, literally is blaspheming God's word. Let's uh, go to Titus 2. I was planning on finishing this today, but I have a feeling I'm going to have to. I'm going to. Let's see what we're at here. Yeah. Yeah. Titus 2, verse 3. Where am I here? I'm starting in verse 3. The age of women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness not false accusers, not given them much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober. Right? And sorry, no not in this church here, but I've had, I've preached to young women, a young woman, her first reaction was, what was that? Twerking. That basically provocative, provocatively dancing in a manner that is very sexualized, if you will. That's not sobriety. That's not sobriety. To love their husbands, to love their children. Right? That's what women ought to be taught. By the way, in our modern day society, when you're sending your child off to daycare so you can work, uh, you go, you return to work early because you know what? You need to make that money, that extra money. Uh, you're, no, you're no longer loving that child. In fact, I'm going to go one step further. You're sending them to the government school. You don't love that child. You don't love your child. To be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. This is the reason that the word, if, you know, if, you're, if, if you're not this, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Or if you are these, the word of God is not blasphemed. So I would say the majority of women, wives, are blaspheming the word of God. I would say the majority of husbands that require their wives to, be, to disobey uh, the precepts and the dictates here in, in, in Titus chapter 2 are blaspheming the word of God. I'll go that, for, I'll go that far as, as to say that. Because there are husbands that are actually command, or really demanding that their wife go out and work. There are, there are actually wives out there that want to want to stay home, they want to raise their children. I'm talking in the secular world, and there are husbands. They're literally demanding that they get out there. <clears throat> and this, I I like to I hate to think that this happens, but it does happen in the churches as well. There are husbands that are requiring their wives to uh, to be out in the workplace. It's not God's will. I look at my warehouse manager. A woman, a black woman. I'm not against black people. We have one here, of course. Well, we have more than one. We have actually, we've got, a, we've got uh, at, at least one. One and a half, one and a half. South yeah. African. Yeah, blau, black and South African. <laughs> Lutheran. Why is that Lutheran? Yeah, <laughs> that's where the problem lies. <laughs> the Lutheran part is the, where I have issues. <clears throat> Yeah, no, we have, uh, and you know, everything she does and everything that she takes pride in, there's a lot of pride there, by the way. When you put on your on your license plate, your license plate is Empress on one of your five vehicles or six or whatever she has now. I mean, that's, you know, it's all about things. It's all about image. But that, you know what? As you get older, that image is going to fade. Those things are not eternal. I mean... Quite frankly, I believe 
the ones that ought to strive to become a warehouse manager are men. If, you, if that's what you want. <clears throat> I wouldn't want that. Because you, you know what? I've learned that becomes your religion. That is your faith. You're, you need to be available 24-7. I'd rather pastor and be available 24-7. And I love that. <laughs> really, amen. Be available 24-7, then be available 24-7 for Costco. Now, when my shift is done, I'm not available anymore. <laughs> I'm done. <clears throat> my availability is now, my availability is out the water now. That's done. When I'm when I've clocked out, you hear that beep, you know, whatever the scan scans my name badge. I'm done. Costco, that is. Yeah, it's an act of blasphemy, blaspheming the word of God. It is the same as saying that God doesn't understand the world and therefore has made a mistake in the principles he has given for us for our guidance. It is not so, bla it is not so great blasphemy to say there is no God as to say there is a foolish God who does not understand what he is about in, the governing, in governing the world, rather. Basically, that's what they're saying. When you think about it, well, you know what? God is really foolish. You know, we've progressed beyond what God has revealed to us. Among the laws he has laid down for us is that which is set forth in the passages from 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy. Let your women keep silence in the churches. I will that men in every place. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man but to be in silence I think God God has given his order very clearly there is a created order men have a tall order and women have a tall order and those lines ought not to be blurred that's why we're living in a society that blurs lines one might say that women are striving to become like men, but in reality, they're trying to become like gods. Genesis 3. That's what they're really, is what feminism is about, is making a woman a god. She becomes a god. So what J.W. Porter says in his book, Feminism, we have it right here if you want to read it. It says, you are, ye are my friends if you do whatsoever. Well, actually, he's, just, he's quoting the, the, uh, the, uh, the Bible here. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. That's what Jesus said. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Why call ye me Lord and do not the things which I say? He saith, he that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ said. Now, finally, in J.W. Porter's chapter, the menace of feminism, we read, quote, to be a keeper at home is aberrant, and by the feminist esteem, to be a relic of barbarism. She revels in the limelight and longs for a career. I just want to stop there. Much of this, this was compiled literally a hundred years ago. Just think about a hundred years ago. I really think every Baptist preacher needs to read that, to be quite frank. She has issued her own proclamation of emancipation and will not slave her life out for any man. She prefers the club and the hotel to the church and the home and the home and and is only at home. She sorry, I'm gonna have to reread that. I'm getting a little bit tied up. She has issued her own proclamation of emancipation and will not slave her life out for any man. She prefers the club and the hotel to the church and the home, and is only at home when she is away from home. Home sweet home long ago lost all its sweetness for her. And just here comes the tragedy of our civilization, the disintegration of the American home and the Canadian home. 100 years ago. Think about that. Wow. The citadel of our civilization has been the solidarity and integrity of our homes. Our nation is impregnable and our flag imperishable. Let's talk about the American. 
so long as the American home remains intact. And the American home will remain intact no longer than the American mother remains what she has been and what the God of heaven and earth intended her to be. Amen? It's pages 22 and 23. Where are we now? Maybe six. I don't know if I should leave it at that. And then uh, 36 minutes. 30, well, I'll read on, continue on here. Who can find a virtuous woman? Verse 10. Who can find her? She is indeed a rare breed, but she's out there. Now the latter part of verse 10 reveals that she is a treasure whose, pr whose price is far above rubies. Think about that. This woman is a virtuous woman. It's not fame, not figure, face, or finances that is impressive about this woman, but her virtue. The, wo the world looks at all the rest. Just look at all the cosmetic products for women. Even the stores that sell cosmetic products for women and effeminate men. It is said to be more valuable than rubies. Rubies were things of great value in the Bible and during those times. Anything more valuable was, was greatly esteemed. Therefore, we can say that a virtuous woman is immeasurably valued in God's eyes. So my question to you here, ladies, do you measure up? Do you measure up? Now I want to draw your attention to verse 1. The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. Like Agur in the previous chapter, Lemuel's identity is, un is very uncertain. Some have, from the meaning of the name unto God, have thought it to be a name for Solomon. And there are some commentators that hold to this. We don't know for sure, of course. So you, you need to be careful what we read into the Bible here. In fact, John Phillips is one commentator that leans to the idea that it was another name for Solomon. Talmudic tradition also seems to believe that both Agur and Lemuel are Solomon. But again, we do not rely on tradition. Nevertheless, we know very little about Lemuel, about Lemuel other than the fact that he was a king and his mother taught. His mother taught him. That's all. Everything else is pure speculation. Yeah. Now there are four major topics that Lemuel's mother covers with him in Proverbs 31. And these are that he ought to guard against women. Verse 3, strange women, of course. Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. And gentlemen that are single here, you must be careful because the wrong women will drain you of your strength. She will consume you. This is why you see men in our society that have been somewhat effeminated or they just, you know what? They want to be as far away from their wives or if their wife just reams on them, they don't respond, they just give in. Why? Because they don't want to hear it. So they just let her have her way. See, what this is what the Bible says here. Let's go to um, Genesis chapter, chapter 3. And we're going to look at verse 16. Oh, I'm in the wrong chapter there. In four. Verse 16. All right. Unto the woman, he said, God said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception in sorrow. Thou shalt bring forth children. Right? That's labor, right? And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Desire here 
literally means, the Hebrew word that underlies it, underlies it literally means that she'll have this natural propensity to want to control him. It speaks of control. So your sin nature, your fallen nature will seek to control your husband. And a man will seek, a man, auto, who's been, rather a man who's been commanded to head his wife, to lead. He will, he will naturally not fulfill that. So he'll actually submit to her control. You see that in the world today with a measure. Right, you do see that. In fact, I see, like when I look at my own children, with them, with the young, with my young men here, it's like you have to instill in them that boldness to take charge. It does not come naturally. Whereas with little Yael, I have to temper to make sure she's not out of line. She will actually seek to control her brothers. Yeah, it happens, and it has to be pointed out. I've actually had to tell her. This is, you know, literally to put her in her place. This is not how things are done. And I've had to tell them, you don't listen to her. You see it in our society. You see it in our churches. You got ladies, women out of order, men who are not fulfilling. They're out of order by not doing what God has called them to be. Leading and heading their wives. Now, I will say this, no husband ought to demand that his wife be obedient to him. He ought not to force the matter. He's not a dictator. God hasn't called you to be a dictator. If she is not obeying God, she's in trouble with God. If your wife is not obeying God, is not submitting to the authority that God has given you, she is the one who's in trouble with God. And God ought to deal with her. So there are four major topics that the mule's mother covers. Guard against women. Not to drink wine, verses 4 to 7. Well, 4 and 5, but 4 and 7. We'll read 4 and 5. It is not for kings, O the mule. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Right? Another topic is when know when to speak. Ladies, know when to speak. Men, same thing, but ladies, know when to speak. Verses 8 and, out, eight and 9. Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all, such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. All right? So we give it a personal application. We do this when we're out there. So what we're doing, we're judging righteously. We're opening our mouth, proclaiming it. And we are actually pleading the cause for the poor and needy, spiritually speaking. And lastly, to find a virtuous woman, verses 10 through 31. And we'll leave it at that. And that's the topic that I'm going to be preaching on for, the, for part three. I was hoping to only make this part two, but of course... It goes longer than what I expect sometimes. Heavenly Father, we give thee thanks for the blessing of thy word. Lord, we give thee thanks for the virtuous woman. Lord, and we pray, Lord, for the ladies here to really aspire to be the Proverbs 30 woman, 31 woman, Lord. Lord, to live virtuously. Lord, as, as, as we seek to please thee, Lord, and thee only. Lord, we pray, Lord, for our time of fellowship, for the good food, Lord. And uh, we, we are also thankful, Lord, uh, for those that have prepared the food, Lord, for the ladies that have, have really put in a labor of love to prepare it, Lord, and, and, and bless, bless their hands and bless them for it. In Jesus' precious and holy name I pray, amen. Amen.